I think we should start. Good morning. Thank you, uh, everyone, for, uh, for joining uh, this uh, public seminar on the Green New Deal, a transatlantic climate change consensus. Uh, my name is uh, Muriel Rouillet. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Nantes and a fellow at the uh, Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation here at the Kennedy School at Harvard. Um, so we, I want, I will greet you first and uh, share with you a few housekeeping items uh, before properly introducing this seminar. First of all, thank you all. We hope that you are still uh, healthy and safe wherever you are tuning in from. We have people from all over the U.S., from Canada, from Turkey, from Europe. It's a truly transatlantic audience and uh, we're very happy about this. Thank you. Thank you to our great panelists, uh, Alisa Battistoni, Sharon Bloch and Pierre Larouturou, whom I will introduce more properly uh, in, in a few moments. Um, so this is a, a public seminar that is um, being hosted by the Ash Center for, the, uh, for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And today, uh, let me thank you uh, from the bottom of our heart, uh, our co-sponsors, so the Ash Center, very supportive of this uh, initiative. We have this uh, seminar of Green Leaders in Democratic Governance, and uh, it's hosted at the Ash Center. Today, uh, other centers are joining us in, in uh, hosting the seminar. The Minda de Gunsburg Center for European Studies at Harvard. Hello, thank you. Uh, also, novelty today, um, a European research unit at the University of Nantes, the Laboratoire Droit et Changement, et Changement Social, sorry, the research unit, Law and Social Change. Thank you for co-sponsoring. I also want to mention today the participation of an association of students at Harvard, the Harvard European Law Association, H-E-L-A, uh, who have been uh, supporting this, um, uh, this seminar. Thank you, thank you for making our universities and debates live across uh, borders. Um, I need to share a few housekeeping items with you, uh, so technicalities uh, that will be uh, helpful for, for the participants. So this is a one hour public seminar and today all our guests who are very busy have to go at the hour at 12. Uh, so typically we have, we record this event, so this is uh, being recorded, and we take public, uh, we take questions from the public. Obviously, we probably won't be able to uh, address all of them, but we have, uh, we, we, we strive to, to, to address most of them. And if you can submit them on the public chat that you can display on your screen, that will be very helpful. If you have not already submitted your questions uh, ahead of time, which was an option. Um, I want to draw your attention on a language um, matter today. One of our participants uh, speaks French and to allow him to better express himself, we decided to translate simultaneously. So soon before uh, Pierre Larouturou speaks, we will enable the language interpretation tab, which is a little icon, a planet uh, showing on your taskbar. So, we are, I'm going to demonstrate this now so that you can see it on your uh, uh, toolbars. So, Jahaida, please, would you kindly enable language interpretation so that we can see the little planet? Yeah, there it goes. So, if you look at your taskbar at the low on the lower part of your screen, you have a little planet. Now, you need to check. You need to click on this planet, and if you don't speak French, you need to check the English, and this is for each participant to do that. You, on this little planet, check the English version so that you receive the English translation while Pierre Larouture will speak in French. If you speak French, that's fine, you can switch to French. And then after uh, Pierre is done with his um, formal presentation, we will switch off the simultaneous translation because otherwise we have issues of volume and you can't hear all. So to simplify matters, will uh, translate consecutively and Pierre understands English very well. So to keep the fluidity of debate, we'll stop simultaneous translation altogether after Pierre's talk and we'll revert to English, which is the working language of the, of the seminar. Okay, clear for everyone. If you have a doubt, you can check in the chat, there is a link to a slide that shows you where the little icon is, where you can find it on your screen. All right, uh, no question, very well. So uh, let me now and finally uh, introduce properly this, uh, the topic of this seminar and our wonderful panelists. So the Green New Deal. In the US, the Green New Deal um, 
is uh, quite controversial. Uh, of course, it refers to the Democrat legacy of uh, Roosevelt, and it has been endorsed by uh, very prominent uh, progressive radical personalities such as uh, AOC or Bernie Sanders. And maybe for that reason, it has become so politicized that people cannot see exactly what's in there. And oftentimes people uh, in America react with a fear uh, or very heavy concerns uh, about this policy program, which is designed to uh, basically uh, reform the capitalist economy of the US and make it more sustainable for uh, people and for the planet. Uh, and basically it's, it's a program of public expenditures and job creation. So of course not everybody agrees in the US with this perspective. Interestingly, the Green New Deal in Europe uh, resonates very differently. It's much more consensual, so much so that the European Commission, under the leadership of Ursula von der, Le von der Leyen, has made the Green New Deal its official roadmap and a very official and mainstream policy to reform the uh, economies of the European Union and make them more compatible uh, with the planet. Now, that being said, uh, do we speak about exactly the same thing on both sides of the Atlantic? That is certainly a very good question that our panelists will address. Now, let me uh, move on to our panelists, three distinguished um, minds. I will uh, introduce them by alphabetical order. So we have first Alisa Battistoni. Alisa, can you uh, come to the forefront? <laughs> Alisa, yeah, Alisa is a political theorist. Uh, she's soon to be an assistant professor in a university in New York. I'm sorry, Alisa, I don't remember which. Uh, Barnard College. Barnard College. So congratulations on your recent you. appointment. And for now, she is still a fellow at the Harvard University Center for the Environment. And together with uh, uh, co-authors Kate Aronoff, Daniel Aldana Cohen, and Thea Rio Franco, she has written um, a book, a little book, you see, it's not so thick. It's extremely interesting. Uh, as you see, I have many bookmarks. Uh, a very interesting book called A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. Obviously, she is strongly supportive of the Green New Deal. But I would recommend anyone uh, to read that book, including and maybe especially people who don't like the Green New Deal, don't know about it, or are scared. Because in this book, you find a lot of precise, specific information and it contrasts with some propaganda and incomplete information that you can find in some highly partisan circles, and uh, which I think is detrimental uh, to um, sensible reflection uh, on the issue. So that is our first panelist. Second panelist, Sharon Block. Sharon is the executive director of the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard Law School. She does an incredible job uh, to educate um, on uh, critical issues uh, that labor play in the capitalist economy of the US. Prior to this position, she has been uh, in key positions in the uh, Obama administration. She was, uh, among other things, and I'm sorry, Sean, I want to do this to you, but I will only quote a few. She has been previously head of the policy office at the US Department of Labor and senior counselor to Secretary of Labor, Tom Perez. Um, she's also a former member of the National Labor uh, Board. And she, uh, among other things, has led the historic White House Summit uh, on Workers' Voice to explore, uh, which was put up by the Obama administration and uh, was um, meant to exploring ways for workers to fully participate in their economic future. And last but not least, Pierre Larouturou. Uh, Pierre Larouturou is a French economist. He has been a long time advocate of sustainable uh, development, of a, um, a sustainable a model of economic development. Today, he is a member of the European Parliament where he sits among other <clears throat> uh, people of, of different member states of the European Union. Uh, he sits in the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats group. This is a political group at the uh, European Parliament. And most importantly, and recently, he has been rapporteur, he has re, uh, reported on the post-2020 European budget. And he has a lot to say about the Green New Deal. Um, so he will explain to us what the Green New Deal is. And he has also criticisms of his own, which are really interesting. So with no further ado, 
I will leave the floor to our panelists and uh, we will start with Pierre Larouturou uh, so that the translation issues go smoothly. So this is now that we all turn our language interpretation. So first we need, we host, need to enable the interpretation uh, tab. Jahaida, can you please enable? Uh, I don't see the planet. Could you please enable the translation? And we have more people in the waiting room. Okay, there you go. So at your right hand, at the task, uh, at the bottom task bar, you click on this little planet. And those of you who don't understand French, you click English. You will receive simultaneous translation by our wonderful translation, uh, Jenna. Okay, and that's and and for those of you who understand French, uh, you you can click French. Pierre, on your end, you click on French. Thank you, so Marielle. That can. <laughs> okay, so Pierre, you have the floor. Then Alisa, and then uh, uh, Sharon for not more than ten minutes each. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Muriel. You can hear me. Yes. Okay. I can. I beg, I beg your pardon for my English. Of course, I am a new member of the European Parliament, and every day I have to work in English and to read English. But my English is very poor, and I think I am ridiculous when I speak English, so I prefer to speak French. I beg your pardon for this problem. So I am very, very happy to have this. Uh, je suis très heureux d'être uh, avec vous aujourd'hui. Uh, J'aurais aimé qu'on ait deux jours de, de séminaire uh, ensemble pour uh, travailler pendant deux jours. Uh, on est vraiment à un moment crucial. Un moment crucial. Ça fait 40 ans que les climatologues. Uh, ce que j'ai pas dit, c'est que avant d'être député. J'étais activiste, j'ai fait un livre, euh, comme Alicia, euh, « A Climate Pact for the European Union, How to Finance the Green New Deal » avec Jean Jouzel. Jean Jouzel était vice-président du GIEC, IPCC, quand le GIEC a reçu le prix Nobel de la paix. Jean Jouzel, c'est un des grands climatologues qui a fait la preuve, il y a 35 ans, du lien entre le CO2 et le dérèglement climatique. Donc, ça fait sept ans que je me bats sur le financement du climat et c'est pour ça que je suis devenu député. Et c'est pour ça qu'on m'a demandé, Muriel l'a dit, d'être rapporteur général. C'est moi qui négocie le prochain budget de l'Europe au nom du Parlement européen. Donc, on est vraiment dans un moment crucial. Euh, hier, pour préparer ce, ce débat, je suis allé sur le site de Mona Loa. Et vous savez, comme moi, qu'on a atteint un niveau jamais vu. Le CO2 dans l'atmosphère était à 417 ppm le mois dernier en moyenne, avec même un pic à 418 ppm. Ça fait 3 millions d'années qu'on n'a jamais vu ça. Et le plus inquiétant, le plus troublant, c'est l'évolution sur un an, plus 2,4 ppm en un an, plus 2,4 ppm malgré la crise économique. Aux États-Unis, en Europe, en Chine, on a beaucoup ralenti l'économie, donc on pensait que ça allait ralentir le CO2, mais on voit 2,4 ppm en plus en un an, c'est trois fois plus, trois fois plus vite que dans les années 60 et 70, quand on a commencé à mesurer le CO2 à Mauna Loa. Donc malgré tout le travail du GIEC, IPCC, Malgré la COP21, la COP22, la COP23, malgré le ralentissement économique, le niveau de CO2 dans l'atmosphère est catastrophique. Et hier, il faisait 38 degrés en Sibérie. Vous voyez le permafrost qui se décongèle et qui envoie du méthane. Donc, il faut absolument, absolument qu'on arrive à, à, à changer complètement de braquet dans la, question, dans la lutte contre le climat euh, très, très vite. Donc, c'est dans ce cadre qu'arrive le Green New Deal. Et on était très heureux il y a presque un an, c'est en juillet dernier, quand Mme Ursula von der Leyen, la nouvelle présidente de la Commission européenne, a décidé de faire du Green Deal sa priorité. Et Muriel l'a dit, c'est très différent de, pour le moment aux États-Unis, mais peut-être qu'après les prochaines élections, ça va changer aux États-Unis. I hope so. Euh, mais aux États-Unis, ce, ce sujet est porté par des gens plus radicaux, entre guillemets, euh, même s'ils font souvent un très, très bon travail. Et j'espérais les rencontrer s'ils étaient venus à, à Harvard après Pâques. Euh, mais en Europe, il y a eu, Mme von der Leyen a eu du courage, moyennant quoi maintenant il y a à peu près un consensus des gens de droite et de gauche, des chefs d'entreprise et des syndicalistes. On vient de faire une vidéo, vous pouvez voir, il y a en même temps le patron des syndicats et le conseiller du pape, du pape François. Quand vous regardez la vidéo de l'appel qu'on vient de lancer avec 700 VIP, il y a en même temps des Youth for Climate de tous les pays d'Europe. Il y a des chefs d'entreprise, il y a des gens de droite, des, des députés de six familles politiques. Et en même temps, symboliquement, le patron de tous les syndicats de salariés et le conseiller du, du pape François depuis les jardins du Vatican. Donc, on arrive à rassembler des gens très différents. Et c'est une bonne nouvelle, c'est vraiment une approche très, très globale. Madame Van der Leyen et son, son équipe, il y a 27 commissaires, elle est la présidente, il y a 26 autres commissaires, nous proposent une approche globale. Je vous enverrai évidemment le PowerPoint. 
On parle aussi bien de transformer l'agriculture que d'investir dans les transports en commun, de changer nos comportements personnels pour arriver à un plus grand niveau de frugalité personnelle, euh, tenir bon sur les objectifs de, de, de CO2. Donc, c'est vraiment une vision globale. C'est à mon avis ça, le premier point positif, c'est tous les secteurs. La vision qu'on a euh, vraiment globale, très ambitieux, c'est baisser de 55% le CO2 d'ici, je sais, 55% les émissions de CO2 par rapport à 1990 d'ici 2030. Et je crois qu'il y a un effet d'entraînement qui est possible. On parle souvent de l'effet de domino pour une catastrophe. S'il y a une banque qui fait faillite, il y aura d'autres banques qui vont faire faillite. Mais peut-être que l'effet de domino, il peut être positif. Que si l'Europe réussit son Green Deal, peut-être que celui qui sera à la Maison Blanche, je vais dire celui ou celle, mais ce sera sans doute un homme qui sera à la Maison Blanche dans quelques mois, pourra s'en inspirer. Peut-être que le Japon, si l'Europe se donne les moyens de réussir le Green Deal, peut-être que le Japon, la Chine fera pareil. Donc, il peut y avoir un, un effet d'entraînement positif. Les difficultés, c'est que c'est global, mais il y a encore des problèmes de cohérence. Par exemple, la politique du commerce international, on a des vrais débats. Est-ce qu'on peut continuer le libre-échange Est-ce qu'on peut continuer pour augmenter les échanges avec le reste du monde, le Mercosur ou autre Est-ce qu'il ne faut pas mettre des règles sociales ou des règles environnementales beaucoup plus fortes Il y a un débat, y compris dans mon groupe. Donc, je suis dans le groupe social-démocrate, qui est le deuxième groupe. On est 150 députés. C'est le deuxième groupe le plus important au Parlement, derrière le, le, le groupe de la droite classique. Moins 55% sur les émissions de CO2, c'est très bien. Mais quand vous parlez avec des climatologues, ils vous disent qu'il faudrait aller encore plus vite si on veut stopper les cercles vicieux, si on veut, si on veut stopper les, les boucles de rétroaction. Et surtout, le très, très gros problème, c'est qu'il y a un énorme problème de financement. Aujourd'hui, euh, on n'a pas l'argent. Et donc, on est en train de chercher. Je sors encore d'une réunion de la commission des budgets. J'y retourne tout à l'heure. On est en train de trouver comment est-ce qu'on peut financer. Ce qui est très intéressant, c'est que la commission européenne elle-même dit que si on voulait réussir le Green Deal, il faudrait entre 400 et 600 milliards d'euros chaque année. C'est assez étonnant. Dans le document du 14 janvier, je pourrais évidemment vous l'envoyer, le premier document un peu concret qui a été proposé par la Mona Lyon, le 14 janvier, ils nous ont dit qu'il faudrait entre 400 et 600 milliards d'euros chaque année pour isoler les maisons et les universités. Et les, et il faudrait faire des transports en commun partout. Il faudrait transformer l'agriculture, développer les renouvelables. Et liste, projet par projet, au total, on arrive à 600 milliards euh, chaque année. Et pour le moment, hélas, ce qui est sur la table, c'est ridicule. C'est 7 milliards sur 7 ans. Voilà. Mais il y a une volonté de coopérer. On voit très régulièrement l'équipe de Van der Leyen. On voit, il y a, euh, autant il y a des pays qui sont bloqués, comme la France ou ailleurs, avec beaucoup de, de manque de dialogue. Autant au niveau européen, des gens de toutes les familles politiques et des gens, il y a trois instances qui dirigent l'Europe. C'est compliqué, hein, même pour un Européen. Il y a le, la Commission, les chefs d'État, Madame Merkel, Monsieur Macron, les 27 chefs d'État et gouvernement qui se retrouvent, et le Parlement. Donc, il y a trois instances. Et il y a vraiment une volonté de coopération, en particulier sur le Green Deal. L'autre bonne nouvelle, c'est qu'il y a des pays qui commencent à s'intéresser vraiment au climat et au Green Deal, alors qu'ils bloquaient il y a quelques années. Enfin, il y a deux semaines, j'ai eu une heure au téléphone le ministre du Climat polonais, Michal Kurtika, qui était le président de la COP à Katowice il y a deux ans, et qui dit comment, hélas, à cause de la réalité thermique, à cause du, euh, les, les esprits évoluent en Pologne, il dit qu'il y a trois ou quatre ans, il y a beaucoup de Polonais qui ne s'intéressaient pas au climat, mais qu'il y a eu deux canicules de suite, deux étés avec des canicules très, très fortes. Et quand on voit un paysan qui pleure à la télé parce qu'il n'a plus d'eau, il n'a plus d'herbe pour ses vaches, et que ce paysan dit qu'il va devoir tuer des vaches parce qu'il n'a plus de quoi les nourrir, eh bien, ce n'est pas des députés, ce n'est pas des climatologues, ce n'est pas Greenpeace, c'est un paysan polonais qui dit « je n'ai plus d'herbe pour mes vaches, c'est une catastrophe ». Et là, de nouveau, on a en Pologne et dans d'autres pays des sécheresses, on est juste au au début du mois de juillet, on a déjà des sécheresses et des pas de Donc, hélas, il y a une... hélas, parce que la situation est dramatique, il y a une évolution des, des, pays, des mentalités. Et il y a des pays qui bloquaient sur la question du, du climat il y a un an ou deux et qui maintenant disent que, OK, mais qu'ils ont besoin qu'on les aide. Donc, la question du financement est clé. En Pologne, par exemple, ils ont encore beaucoup de charbon. Il y a des pays où il n'y a plus de charbon en Europe, mais il y a des pays où le charbon est encore très important. L'autre jour, je parlais avec un autre ministre polonais qui dit, si on ne veut pas avoir une catastrophe sociale, il nous faut 500 millions d'euros, 500 millions pour fermer proprement une mine de charbon. Pour fermer humainement, pour faire les choses bien socialement, ça coûte 500 millions pour chaque mine. Euh, on a 30 mines. Donc, il faut 15 milliards d'euros. Qui c'est qui va nous donner ces 15 milliards d'euros On ne sait pas les trouver. Et, et par ailleurs, il faut faire de l'argent pour les transports en commun. Il faut isoler les maisons. Notre objectif, c'est qu'on puisse rendre obligatoire ce qu'on appelle une directive européenne qui dit dans 20 ans, toutes les maisons doivent être isolées. Dans 20 ans, toutes les écoles, toutes les universités, tous les doivent être isolés. Dans 20 ans, voilà les noms pour l'agriculture. Mais ça n'est possible que si on aide les gens financièrement. 
on estime que pour faire une vraie isolation, les deux, vous savez comme moi que les, le transport et l'habitat, les logements, c'est les deux sources de CO2 les plus importantes chez nous et sans doute dans beaucoup de, de nos pays. Euh, et si on veut rendre obligatoire ces travaux, il faut qu'il y ait des aides. On ne peut pas demander à chaque famille de payer 20 000 euros de travaux. On ne peut pas demander à chaque petite entreprise de payer les travaux tout seul. Du coup, on propose trois solutions. On a lancé un collectif avec 700 personnalités. Il y a déjà un million de citoyens qui nous soutiennent et on met ces idées sur la table et on essaie de convaincre Mme Merkel, M. Macron, Mme Van der Leyen de les reprendre. On est au cœur des négociations. Là, il y a encore trois mois de négociations très importantes avec trois solutions. Le parallèle qu'on fait, c'est que j'ai une amie qui est docteur qui travaille contre le sida, le VIH. Il dit qu'on n'a jamais trouvé une molécule, un médicament efficace. Mais si on prend les trois médicaments de la trithérapie, on peut stopper le virus. Et que si on veut trouver des financements à la hauteur pour le climat, on propose aussi trois solutions. Premièrement, c'est une banque du climat très ambitieuse qui ferait des prêts à taux zéro. Que tous ceux qui veulent isoler leur maison, tous ceux qui veulent faire des transports en commun dans leur ville, tous ceux qui veulent aider des agriculteurs à investir dans le biogaz, ils aient des prêts à taux zéro. Concrètement, comment on fait Je ne veux pas être trop technique, mais la Banque centrale européenne fait beaucoup de liquidités. De même que la réserve fédérale fait beaucoup de liquidités, de même que la Banque du Japon fait beaucoup de liquidités. Encore la semaine dernière, la, semaine dernière, la Banque centrale européenne a annoncé qu'elle créait, qu'elle donnait 1300 milliards, 1300 milliards d'euros à taux négatif, moins 1% aux banques, en espérant que les banques allaient relancer l'activité. Le bilan qu'on fait, on vous enverra tous les documents que vous voulez, du précédent quantitative easing, la Banque centrale avait déjà créé 2600 milliards et on, pouvait, on a montré les chiffres à l'appui, c'est très concret. On a montré comment sur les 2600 milliards créés déjà par la Banque centrale, il y en a seulement 11% qui est allé dans l'économie réelle. Vous voyez, on a décortiqué le bilan de la Banque centrale. Il y en a seulement 11% qui est allé dans l'économie réelle et l'essentiel est parti sur les marchés financiers. Donc, est-ce, que, est-ce qu'on continue et J'ai eu l'occasion d'en parler avec Christine Lagarde, j'étais à Francfort avec la patronne de la TCE en février. Le Parlement dit, nous ne voulons pas, que, c'est des sommes colossales, 1300 milliards d'euros créés en une journée, 1300 milliards. Est-ce que ça va encore et toujours à la spéculation ou est-ce que ça va intégralement pour le climat et, et l'emploi Et donc, le Parlement demande ça. Deuxièmement, c'est un budget pour avoir des subventions, que chaque famille puisse être aidée. Si vous devez faire des travaux, que au moins la moitié de la facture vous aurez des gens compétents pour faire les travaux de okay. uh, excuse me, pardon me to interrupt. Yes. We have to, uh, we have to, uh, for now, inter- uh, you know, close this presentation and okay. go back to, yeah, because we already have a very interesting questions. Uh, Pierre, problem, and we'll go. Okay. I like, yeah, I no, like, no, no, it's fine. Oh. It's perfect. But, you know, uh, we have one hour. And so we have, okay. a f- I know okay. it's constrained. But thank, thank you so you. much. And we'll go back to some of your points because thank there are you. questions about that. So next, uh, Alisa, uh, could you please share your thoughts uh, on the American side of the, the question uh, based on the book you co-authored? With your, uh, with Kate Aronoff, uh, Daniel Aldana Cohen, and Thea Rio Francos, I show the book once again. Uh, it's a great book, and I think it truly advances the uh, the knowledge, uh, academic knowledge, and truth rather than fantasies and scare. And I think it's always good, even if you disagree with ideas, to at least confront the real ideas. Okay, Alisa, floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Muriel, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, so I'm going to say um, fairly briefly sort of what the argument um, we're trying to make in the book was uh, and then try to offer a few thoughts on um, how we're sort of the moment we're in around the Green New Deal in the U.S. now, uh, particularly in relation to the two sort of major political developments of the past few months in the U.S., which um, are, of course, the COVID crisis um, and the recent uh, uprisings for racial justice in this country, and both of which I think are very um tightly connected to the Green New Deal and what we um, should imagine doing going forward. So um, first to just start on the idea that um, we're arguing from the book. So we wrote the book um, to, to build on the Green New Deal framework um, put forward by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey and their Green New Deal resolution um, that was uh, a little over a year ago that was sort of outlining a, a like minimal framework for what a Green New Deal um, might look like in the U.S. Um, and that, uh, you know, sort of had both a, a vision of, of energy transition, but also of um, a broader sort of connection to um, what are often thought of as sort of social issues or justice issues. Um, and so what we wanted to do was to argue that um, 
for why those things should go together and why those things need to go together. So to argue that um, the Green New Deal is, uh, is a way to tackle racial and economic inequality um, and the climate crisis at the same time. And that is not only um, sort of adding on the kinds of justice issues, um, uh, like the, you know, this resolution had things like housing and um, uh, like a jobs guarantee or um, like, arguments about uh, using the Green New Deal to attack poverty and things like that. Um, but that we're arguing that we really need to have a, a vision for climate action that isn't about austerity, about um, sort of cutting back and people needing to, um, you know, um, where the vision is that you have to, to cut back on your standard of living or, um, or suffer sacrifices, uh, but rather that the Green New Deal can be a way of um, actually improving people's lives, of making sure people have access to things like uh, housing and public transportation and so on. Um, and so we try to focus on um, things like green jobs and a green jobs guarantee. We argue for seeing care work as a form of green job, um, uh, for, uh, for building out green public housing to address um, a really nationwide housing crisis in the US um, uh, in a way that is, you know, makes it possible to live in sort of dense areas that are near public transportation um, to, in a way, in a way that you can afford to actually live, because a lot of people are really um, struggling with high rents, um, to build out free pub public transportation and so on. So to sort of see the you know um, climate program as, as going beyond um, just an energy transition, even though we obviously also need an energy transition, but to look more broadly at sort of how we're living and working and all of these things, as Pierre sort of um, suggested that we really need to look at all of the ways we live. So that was the argument. And then to, to, to see, um, you know, this is a way, again, to build a mass movement for climate action and to have genuine public support instead of having this be something that's imposed on people um, uh, in a way that we worry might spark the kind of resistance that we have seen um, uh, in France most um, significantly in the Yellow Vest movement um, around a, a sort of rejection of a um, uh, something that's like a, you know, imposing like a tax on fuel or on um, carbon in a way that just raises costs without sort of like delivering anything else for people. So that's the kind of general idea of the book. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on like the specific proposals we have. If people have questions, um, feel free to um, drop them in the chat. And I know Sharon's going to talk more about um, the labor aspect, which we talk about a lot in the book. But um, I just want to say a bit about, um, yeah, sort of where we are now, because I think um, the political situation has shifted so drastically <laughs> in the past few months, um, but in ways that I think um, I think both uh, COVID and the recent protests we've seen uh, make clearer than ever to me at least why um, climate justice has to be at the heart of climate action and um, why these sorts of measures that we're writing, arguing for, really have to be at the heart of a Green New Deal and, and why we need a Green New Deal really. So, um, so to start briefly with COVID, so um, this is obviously in addition to, you know, the mass loss of life, which is just continuing here in the U.S. and looks likely to, you know, um, rates have really not, of infection have really not decreased very much so far, so we're in for a long haul here. Um, but in addition to the, you know, effects on people's health and lives, we know that there's a really huge um, economic impact that's likely to continue, particularly in light of, I think, in, uh, inadequate um, relief and support policies. But, um, you know, we have 14 million people have filed for unemployment benefits. The unemployment rate is up to um, I think 13% in May, and it's probably more, um, certainly more um, than that, uh, if you're not just keeping this sort of formal count. Um, so there's obviously a, a real, you know, there, we've had one stimulus package, um, and we argued in advance, you know, at this, the outset of the coronavirus crisis, we, you know, we, um, we had always sort of envisioned the Green New Deal as, as um, being something that might get started uh, through a stimulus measure of some kind. And, and in the book, we talk a little bit about um, moments of economic crisis as opportunities to sort of um, to, to do these kinds of transformative projects. Obviously, the New Deal itself was a response to um, the Great Depression. Uh, and we talk a little bit about what we saw as some of the um, the missed opportunities of the Obama stimulus in terms of like really spending a lot of money um, to get a, a really robust climate program going. Um, and so obviously there was this opportunity for this, but it was not, um, we didn't have sort of the political uh, power and political, um, you know, uh, we didn't, we were not going to get a major green stimulus out of the Trump administration and current Congress, and we didn't, <laughs> but we did see that you can spend a lot of money very quickly. So, you know, there was a $2 trillion stimulus 
um, two of my co-authors, Daniel uh, Cohen and Pierre Rio Francos, had been involved um, and have continued to be involved with a, a group of scholars and activists who have drafted a, um, a green stimulus plan, which you can find online. Uh, but that's just outlining the case for um, uh, for spending. You know, for spending this amount of money, we should spend it in a way that can start to lay the groundwork for. Um, a green recovery. Um, obviously, we can't be putting people back to work in like a green jobs program immediately for um, safety and health reasons, but that we should start um, laying the groundwork for uh, a, an ongoing green recovery in a way that can start to um, do some of the infrastructure work, the um, the work around you know building up public housing uh, and so on that we we know we need um, and that can you know uh, can help. You know, we we argue in the book for a jobs guarantee, so we think that something like that would be a really powerful demand in this moment when a huge number of people are unemployed and are likely to be um, into the future. Since I, I doubt we're going to be seeing a V-shaped recovery where we have a, a quick economic recovery here in the U.S. Um, so we, uh, you know, there is. Um, although we obviously didn't get a green stimulus on the first round of stimulus spending, you know, I think this is going to be an ongoing fight and something that we really need to continue to talk about the Green New Deal um, and the need to spend stimulus money um, in ways that can start to set us on, on that like uh, decarbonizing track. Um, and then I think the other thing that's really important to talk about is um, the way we can connect the Green New Deal to current struggles for racial justice um, in the United States. and. Uh, in particular, I want to talk a little bit about the model that we've been seeing coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement for divest invest. So um, organizers have been calling for divestment from spending on police uh, in um, cities across the country. So this is like the defund the police call, um, but that you're you're reallocating those funds um, away from sort of punitive measures towards social programs that can address things like mental health crises, um, uh, invest in safe and accessible public housing, um, expand care services, um, and things like that. And so I think this is a model that's very similar to some of the things that um, climate activists have been calling to, and that we actually is, like, works very well together in terms of the kinds of things we want um, to argue for um, uh, in terms of divesting from uh, fossil fuels and other um, and the sort of broader apparatus of fossil fuel infrastructure and support um, and investing in things that actually do keep us safe and healthy um, and I think a lot of those are really compatible with the, um, the demands of um, the defund police movement which are things like um, safe accessible public housing we would say green public housing um, public transit so that uh, people who are um, you know, people are able to get around without a car. Um, the expansion of care, again, we argue for care as a way of um, improving people's lives in low resource ways. Um, and so I think that we should really be talking about that and in particular about how um, we can target a Green New Deal, uh, you know, right now. Um, so both coronavirus has, um, has disproportionately impacted the Black community in the U.S. Um, there, it, the, both infection and death rate has been simply higher for, um, for communities of color and black people in particular. So we're talking about how we can, um, you know, I think that points to some broader disparities, um, both economic uh, disparities in access to care. Um, we know people who suffer from greater air pollution have higher rates of death from uh, coronavirus. So all these places I think are intersections of inter, you know, environmental justice and um, sort of the other problems we're facing currently. Um, but also, you know, right now, uh, the, the economic crisis I mentioned is um, particularly severe for, um, for Black people. So the less than half of Black adults currently have a job, um, and those who still do are disproportionately frontline like, essential workers who are at greater risk of infection. Um, and so I think we really need to figure out how a recovery measure, um, you know, how can we have a green jobs program that is both addressing the broad uh, crisis of unemployment, but particularly is supporting um, uh, the black community in uh, in the recovery, but also in attacking the very long-standing um, uh, disproportionate unemployment rate um, for Black Americans. So um, I think there are a lot of there are more potential um, I think overlaps between those, but I really think that um, we need to be thinking about how to build these kinds of movements together um, and to really be putting pressure on. Uh, on both people who are currently uh, in office and those who are running for office. Um, obviously, Joe Biden is sort of uh, the, or is the Democratic candidate for president and is um, certainly uh, would be much better for a Green New Deal than Donald Trump. But really, um, 
uh, I think has, although he has paid lip service to the Green New Deal, I, I think he has a long way to go to really get um, him to uh, commit to, to something on the scale we need. Um, you know, Pierre uh, Alisa, that. I'm sorry, Alisa, I'm just going to have to interrupt you as I did very rudely <laughs> with Pierre. That's fine. Uh, so that we, we can move on because time flies and uh, we can go back to these questions. And if we don't address all of them, we'll uh, you know follow up uh, by written form, uh, I promise. Okay, so uh, Sharon, I think uh, what Sharon uh, might have to say will certainly uh, echo very nicely with uh, with what Alisa says and, and also with, uh, with the European perspective. Sharon, what is your take on, on all this? Thank you, Muriel. So I think what I'd like to add to this conversation is um, sort of focusing on the central role that I think the labor movement needs to play in moving a Green New Deal or any kind of um, serious climate agenda, especially um, around issues of just transition. So what I wanna focus on um, are the challenges um, for the labor movement in the U.S. to facilitate that kind of social dialogue about a green economy and a just transition. So I'm going to be honest with all of you up front. I'm not going to get into the politics of the labor movement and like which unions support the Green New Deal and which don't. Instead, I'd like to focus on the role that our law in the United States plays in making it difficult for even the most supportive labor unions to negotiate their way to playing a positive role in advancing um, a climate agenda, uh, and and to do this, really to to um, make a plea that we need to have this kind of mutual commitment um, between the labor movement to support an environment to support the environmental movement and a a, a climate crisis agenda, um, but then also for the environmental movement to support. Um, a labor law reform agenda. And I think that's the only way that we're actually gonna make um, progress. Um, so the question of the future of, the collective, of what collective bargaining, what the labor movement should look like has been the subject of a project that I launched here at Harvard Law School with Professor Benjamin Sachs. We call it a clean slate for worker power, building a just economy and democracy. And so what I wanted to do is just give an overview for the non-labor lawyers in the audience, which would I, I imagine is probably okay. almost everybody, <laughs> <laughs> of how U.S. law ha does has made the labor movement here so weak and what changes could strengthen it so it could be a better partner in addressing the climate crisis. And just you know, one statistic to throw out there to really underscore how weak the labor movement has become in the United States, um, the rate of union membership in the United States is now lower than it was over 80 years ago before American workers even had a federally protected right to join a union. Um, so what that's, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors in that, but um, one of the principles of the Clean Slate Project is that labor law is really, is, is a central piece to solving that problem. Um, and then, again, can then, uh, if we can rebuild the labor movement, um, we can rebuild our economy in a more just way, which will then create that kind of political power for workers to have a voice in the kinds of big debates, um, as we've heard from the other panelists, that we need to have in order to advance um, the Green New Deal or other, any other serious um, climate agenda. So just want to explain quickly four key weaknesses that are relevant for this conversation. So first is the level at which collective bargaining happens in this country. So since 1935, collective bargaining in the US has largely taken place at the level of the firm between unions and a single employer. For people outside the United States, this probably sounds crazy and it is. It's, it, is a, it, it is a huge constraint on the ability of workers to really build power. It might have made sense in the 1930s when the economy was dominated by big manufacturing industrial companies, think of like General Motors. Um, but, but this firm by firm um, mode of organizing is really um, an obstacle. So I mean, think about it. if the labor movement wanted to negotiate clean energy policies across a sector of the economy, um, which would obviously have great efficiency, they'd have to organize each employer in the sector, negotiate sec 
separate collective bargaining agreements, as opposed to being able to sit down with the employers across the sector, like happens in Europe, like happens in most of the rest of the world. So the second uh, weakness is in the protection for collective action. So the number of, of significant strikes in the US had been falling significantly. So before about 2017, we were down to um, fewer than 10 significant strikes each year in the country. That number has been rising again, um, but not in any way close to, to the kinds of movements that you need to really change <clears throat> to affect big political change. So, Workers in the US can effectively be fired for engaging in a strike. Um, here, there, we sort of use an Orwellian euphemism. We say that workers can be permanently replaced if they engage in a strike, but that's workers know that really means that they can be fired. Um, and this is sort of technical, but take my word for it. We also prohibit unions from allowing workers to sort of analyze power relationships and exercise collective power strategically. Um, and so to convince workers to go out and, and strike in support of a climate agenda, you have to convince them uh, to be willing to risk losing their jobs. Now we, you know, we have seen some of that, especially you know, in, with sort of higher skilled, um, higher paid workers willing to push back on their employer's um, climate uh, positions. But for, but for the vast majority of workers, it's really a lot to ask for them when they know that they can be fired for um, engaging in a strike. But perhaps most significantly for the purpose of this conversation, our labor law fails in that it greatly restricts the range of issues over which workers have even the right to bargain. So the, for the most part in this country, workers only have a right to bargain over wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment. Um, they don't have a right to bargain or take collective action over their, their employer's political positions or their environmental impact. So what this means for moving a climate agenda is that US workers' ability to put green policy on the table in collective bargaining is completely dependent on the employer's discretion. Um, and finally, US labor law excludes workers from any right to a voice in corporate boardrooms. So unlike many European countries, we do not here really have any workers on corporate boards. So in our Clean Slate project, we advocate for significant changes to all of these aspects um, of labor law. Uh, and we think it's really a critical piece of giving workers the kind of political power that they need to have the social dialogue with the government, with employers, and with workers to move this kind of agenda. And so um, I've really been spending a lot of time and been so grateful to engage with Muriel over thinking about how we can bring these two uh, movements more closely aligned, move labor law reform agenda and move an environmental agenda. All right, thank you very, very much. Before, before yeah, no, you, 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 kept the, you kept the time perfect. Uh, thank you. Very enlightening. You're even one minute early and we'll put this to good use. We have many questions. So um, I have been reading and gathering them. So I, obviously I'm not sure we can enter into detailed um, interaction with each of the participants, but I think a few questions. So let me hear quote the people who uh, have submitted the questions that I'm bundling here. Um, I will address a bundle of questions first to Alisa and, and Sharon, okay? And you start it out between you two to, to answer. Uh, Arthur Segawa, uh, Mr. Bowers as well. Uh, there are questions on basically how widespread, how popular, how uh, well spread into the citizenry this um, consensus for Green New Deal is actually in the US, but uh, I think uh, Arthur Segawa also questions the, the existence of a consensus uh, in Europe. And I think this, this is a real question. So one aspect of the question, again, I take this from, uh, from our participants, is the one aspect is the gentrification of a Green New Deal or of the green agenda in general. We all know those fancy, uh, you know, electric cars, those fancy things that rich people can do, but, but for, for people to actually uh, engage into this and to be convinced, uh, there needs to be something, for what's in there for them. And that's where trade unions come handy, uh, except for the structural um, obstacles that they meet in US law. So 
what so same question to to all of you is it really so consensual in your country or in your area of, of uh, you know expertise uh, and what could we do what can we do what has been done to really increase this popular consensus uh, and it, so it means also alliance with the climate movement, which is not always on the same line with uh, with the trade union movement. So can you please, each of you, uh, address this question in, in one minute each? Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll have a second uh, batch of questions. Um, Sharon and Alisa. Sure, I can start and be quick. You know, I, I think within the labor movement, we are seeing growing consensus. I don't, you know, I don't think that the labor movement is not monolithic, obviously, but I think that there has been a big shift. But again, I think a really important part is to bring in these ideas around just transition. So it isn't only about what industries need to be curtailed, but then putting into the agenda what, as the Green New Deal does, and as Alyssa, you know, focused on a lot, what does an environmental agenda look like for workers who may be disrupt, you know, displaced from their jobs or other aspects of the, the economy disrupted, you know, what then happens to the people? And I think that's why it's so important to have a strong labor movement, because those are issues that really, that is the way that we hear from workers broadly in this country or the way we, sh we historically have and should again. All right. Thank you. We'll take that. And Alisa, would, would you like to, to add? Yeah, um, I mean, I completely agree with everything Sharon said about how important the labor movement is to the Green New Deal, and I do think that the just transition is is really key to um, you know to to make sure that people don't see um, climate action as coming at the expense of their own jobs, their own like ability to survive, um, and that I think one of the challenges is just that showing that the climate movement can deliver on things like green jobs because i think it's one thing to say green jobs and then to actually like have them come through and that is obviously a, a sort of i think sometimes a chicken and egg problem it seems of, of having you know um the power to win things which requires labor movement backing um and then being able to say like uh people actually trusting that there will be the green jobs on the other side but that's something that um i think i agree is, is sort of um changing um and then on the sort of questions you mentioned around like um or, or so the sort of the way that climate action is often seen as like a gentrified thing or something for um, better off people who can buy a tesla or um, afford to install solar panels i think that's definitely been the case of a lot of with a lot of um the ways that um climate action has been treated as like a sort of consumer um something to adjust through individual consumer choice um but we're trying to almost invert that and say like instead of um, having the model where like Tesla develops a very expensive car and then um, it's sort of sub the, the very expensive car subsidizes like future R&D that eventually, you know, maybe delivers like a, a, a sort of um, normally priced car for, for everyone else who can afford a car. <laughs> um, what if we imagined it where we like really put the kind of, um, you know, we, we focused on building like green buses, um, electric buses, we focused on um, building out like green public housing rather than like sort of trickling down the technology from, um, from wealthy consumers to, to everyone else. So we're trying to invert that and say like, it's not a luxury to live um, in an energy efficient building um, that isn't toxic, you know, that should be a thing that we see as like a baseline for, for what people can expect. But okay, I agree that there's not consensus with the, the question about consensus. There's not yet. So we really need to build that. So yeah, there's a lot uh, to, of work to do. So Pierre, um, I'm not going to ask, you know, the European to give and to lecture America on what it should do better. But I, what I would like to ask you is knowing that uh, we don't, we might not have the, the beautiful consensus we claim to have in Europe. We have, as you mentioned yourself, Poland, who has difficulty to transition to a sustainable economy. So based on your experience and on the real difficulties that you don't ignore, uh, you mentioned them and you're actually concerned with the, the fate of this Green New Deal, which might be a bit cosmetic. And uh, you, re you wrote an article on greenwashing, the risk of greenwashing. So this is something that the EU is prone to. And we, we don't want to, you know, to uh, sing um, our own laurels. Uh, this, is, this is another place to do that. So, but, but what is your experience? Because uh, Europe is a very 
is a consensus machine, but it's very difficult to build consensus. And from the very difficulties that you have encountered and that the EU is encountering, what can you say? What can you say to American people who are, eh, you know, not quite sold to this? But, but you maybe can you know, mention a few things, like real problems that in your experience, we could benefit from your experience. We don't hear you, can you please unmute yourself? And here, so Pierre, uh, unmute. Yes, you're here. Uh, no, you are muted. So, you yeah, hear me? Okay. Yes, do you, want to, do you want to answer in French and I will do a quick translation or do you want to speak in English? Perhaps yeah, it's better I, if I speak French, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, uh, so you speak French, I quickly translate and then... So and no, you perhaps don't speak. I, can, I can try to English, perhaps it's more easy. As so you wish, think, uh, that's not a problem, you can do French. First problem, I have a technical problem, I, don't, I, I lost the the last minute of Sharon, I beg your pardon, I have, I have no internet. But I think the answer of the, for your question, Muriel, is uh, in Alisa and Sharon's uh, speech. Uh, first, we, we must explain that it's not a radical idea, it's a win-win uh, proposition. So, uh, now, we, in French, in, um, in uh, European, we speak not Green Deal, we say, we say Climate and Jobs Pact. Climate and Jobs Pact, because with the crisis, the, most, the first problem for many families is uh, the, the jobs uh, um, uh, problem, the unemployment. So I, it's very important to, 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 to explain concretely who will pay. Alisa said we have a yellow jacket in France, and I understand the yellow jacket. 30% uh, of French guy or German guy have not one euro of economy. Every month they have a problem with their bank. They have not one euro uh, uh, on, on the, in their bank, and they can't they can't pay for the green deal. It's not to the, these people to pay. So we propose to use differently the the money of the ECB. When last week last week the European Central Bank has created in one day in one day the ECB create thousand three hundred eight billions of euro and give to the banks at a negative rate. So ca how can you explain that we will tax Mr. And, uh, all the people if there are so much money given uh, to, to the bank? So we, we, I have a good discussion with Christine Lagarde in Frankfurt. I have discussion with the parliament say this money is a very good idea. Thank you, Christine Lagarde. Thank you, the Bank Central, the European Bank Central. But it's not possible to give this money to the bank without any control, without any guidelines. And, and if we don't control, it will go to the speculation. And so we, we, we will strike to this money go to the climate. And uh, the, another idea to finance is a tax on financial, financial transaction tax. And I explained uh, three weeks ago, I was with Ursula, after Ursula von der Leyen in the parliament, really. And I explained when I, bu when I bought my iPhone, I, I had a tax of 19%, 19%. When I, when I have to buy something to, to eat food, all the people and the poor people too must have a tax, must buy, have a tax of 5%. For, to, to buy food in the no common uh, uh, life, but for the transaction, financial transaction, there is 0.0, .0 tax. Can we explain that? Of course not. And so we propose, I rapporteur general du budget, I, I say the parliament can't accept the new budget, we can't accept. And last week I, have, I was very happy because five groups do agree with me. I, I am not just a, a guy alone. I have the support of five different groups in the parliament who say we can't accept the new budget if there is not new own resources. We can take, have a little tax, 0.1% on the financial transaction. And every year, in, in the, now if there is a crisis, economic crisis, but there is very, very important activity in, on, on the NASDAQ, on the, on the Dow Jones, on the CAC 40 in France. And if we create, it's possible in one year or one year and a half, to create a financial transaction tax in Europe, and it can it can give every year 60 billion. Another tax is to propose a tax on benefits on profits for the big enterprise. And so we propose to with five new own resources. With there is no baguette magic, there is no one solution. But with five new own resources, we can have a double. I think when Roosevelt come in the White House. Uh, Roosevelt decided to, to triple, triple the federal budget. 
And he said, uh, Franklin Roosevelt said, I want to balance that budget and, and create new, to, new tax. And so we, we won't make to the same. A second important, uh, Sharon said we have to explain, and I do agree with Sharon like I do agree with Alisa, which, uh, the, the social dimension of the Climate and Jobs Pact. And not here we are uh, intellectual uh, when, when you participate at, like this reunion, but my mother is low, is a commodity is a, a cleaning lady, cleaning lady, cleaning lady. And my, my, uh, I have a son of 16 years who don't enter to the economy. We have to explain to the normal people, not just to the university. Of course, it's very important to, to brainstorm with the university, but we, we can't win the battle if we have just the university with us. I, we have, we must have all the citizens, y compris the yellow jacket. And so Sharon was very good when she explained the social dimension of the, the well, and so we explained we will create jobs. We can create 5 million jobs with this pact in, in Europe. I explained uh, uh, one year ago, I was in Grenoble in the south of France. It was very interesting. I, I speak, I spoke with a very normal uh, um, uh, a guy, a social, who, he, we live in a social housing and he explained that he was in this social housing for 15 years, but for three years, there is an insulation of his houses. And he explained, he's not a, a member of the parliament, it's not a university, it's a normal guy who explained, grass uh, with its thanks. insulation, thanks to the insulation, it's, it's very more comfortable. In summer, it's not so hard. In winter, it's not so, too cool. But, and he said, I win every year 800 euros I win for, for, for so made the, um, expenses. on expenses uh, on fuel. Uh, so he explained it's good for the planet. It's good to create jobs in the insulate. But he said for my family, for my own family, it's more comfortable. And every year I can help for my family eight and with euros instead of giving this money to uh, uh, with gas to Mr. Putin or to, to, or Total or Exxon. This eight and with zero hard for my family every year. So he explains the social dimension. We create jobs, we have a better life in summer and in winter, and I have eight hundred euros every year to, to I can use differently. So I think if we want to win this battle, we must make a very large coalition. I said we are um, well, uh, seven hundred people. VIP. I don't know what is it uh, to propose this climate and jobs pact with. For us, the good green deal for Europe. We explain how to finance without and without uh, have a yellow jacket in all the streets, and we we see the dimension. And we have also the ETUC, the European uh, Trade Unions, and the the advisor from the Pope Francis. And we have people of left and people of right, youth, young youth for climate. And the, and I think we have in in Europe the the six months the, the, the six command prochain mois the six it should be for my english i beg your pardon are very critical because uh, Euro, europe is the first continent who say green deal is our priority trump say climate i i don't uh, i fuck the the, the GIEC, i fuck ICSPT. but here in europe we say it's our priority so we must win this battle it's in it's common uh, it's catastrophic what is what, what the right the catastrophic and oh, I okay thank, thank, thank you yeah I thank you, you no, I, no your english is, is quite good actually we, we, we understand so thank you very much for this precision so i i just want to give the floor to one person david wood is david wood uh here he asked a good uh, question which uh, is um, you know a good question for the us and for uh for america uh, for europe uh, it, it's it's true Pierre. yeah we, we do it we do it i don't know if we always do it as much as we say uh but let's take the we do it uh the way it can work in the us in the us it's all about jobs so let's do it let's create green jobs i think even trump uh, would agree to that or trump voters uh, but the question and this is a david wood question david are you with us uh is, is how how to create good green jobs you know if if you want to make workers transition to the green economy which did not happen so well in the u.s recently which i'm not sure is happening that well in in, in europe maybe it is so how how do you create those good jobs david are you with us can you come I forward? No. I want to yeah. hear, All right. I yes. hear what the panelists have to say about that. What do they need to yeah. hear about me? <laughs> uh, David, so please ask your question quickly and we'll close on this because we have like one minute left. Yeah. So David. 
Well, I mean, I, th I think I'm drawing from the work of, the, of, uh, of Sharon and, and Alyssa about a study as well. I mean, I think in the US, we have tended to think green jobs naturally will be good jobs. And uh, we've, there's been a lot of hype around green jobs and there's not a lot of focus around labor. So one of the things we've been looking at, so we think about how private investors invest in the just transition and they can support good public policy. What you find in the renewable sector is that wind power jobs up in Minnesota have lower wages, poor health and safety outcomes, poor self and safety outcomes, and they're not durable, right? They're casualized. And that's what's on offer to the people working at coal-fired plants uh, a few states to the south. So you're asking them to move to jobs that are less adequate. Um, that's not the path towards building the socially cohesive support for a policy that's going to work at scale. And I think, you know, certainly what Sharon said about, I think public, public investment has to attach these conditions because it drives all the private investment in infrastructure anyway. But we also need a coherent framework where labor and, and climate risk are, are fully integrated. All right, thank you very much for this question. So anyone, can we provide a, an answer in one minute because all our panelists have to go after which we can hang out together if, if you want, I, I will, you know, provide more time. And I, I but uh, in, in the choice of question, I tried to select questions for which the answer would address many of the other questions that we received. So that's a very good question with multidimensional aspects. Do you, uh, what's your quick 30 seconds take, each of you? on this question. And you're all muted for some reason. So Pierre, Alisa, and Sharon, would you please, yeah, unmute yourselves. I'm happy to jump in. I mean, as David said, I think I said in the chat, you know, public investment is a great way to, um, you have a lot of levers and attached conditions. We tried to do this um, by making, applying Davis-Bacon wages um, to the Recovery Act and the Obama administration. Clearly we could do more, but really the answer is to make sure that a lot more workers in the, in the United States are uh, represented by a labor union and there are real negotiations over what the terms and conditions of employment are. With sectoral bargaining, you also can get to that more quickly because you take wages out of competition and so you don't have this dynamic of driving down wages, which is what we have in so many industries today. One minute. All right, thanks, Sharon. Uh, Pierre, would you like to uh, answer that somehow? Yes, I think if we want to do jobs like Sharon explained, we, we need a public investment and long term, not three years or four years, but I, we, we ask in yes. Europe to have 20, excuse me, 20 years, to, to, excuse me, to have money during 20 years and to have in the same time a law who said all the houses must be insulated, all the agriculture must be transformed. And if you have money, really money, every country, France, Allemagne, Germany, Poland say they have 2% of GDP who come. You know, Nicolas Stern, he explained that if we want to win the battle, the climate battle, every country needs 2% 2, 2 or 3% of its GDP. So if we have a treaty, a re European treaty, a European pact, who say, don't be anxious, every country will have money during 20 years. And in the same time, you have a law who said all the houses must be insulated. The sector of uh, bâtiment of housing will create new jobs and will, will farm, will um, on, form, a, uh, form or, training the, the people and they will have good jobs and good revenue during these years. I think it's important to have the, the three action together. Okay, thank you, Pierre. Uh, Alisa, you want to add something to that? I'm not sure I have much to add. I, I totally agree with Pierre and Sharon that public investment is key and so is um, strengthening workers' rights to organize and to uh, ability to, you know, to raise wages through collective action. So um, I think those are all really important. And probably in some cases, you know, there might be cases where we even have just transitions that are, um, you know, uh, say for like coal miners in West Virginia that are just guaranteeing people's, you know, sort of like retirement and healthcare packages um, mm -hmm. for coal companies that are going bankrupt that I think that would be a worthwhile um, public investment too. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, there might be cases where it just means winding that industry down and supporting people. So, right. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, yes. It should yeah. be another, another yes. idea. Yes. Another idea, you remember the law FATCA, Barack Obama in, 20, uh, in 2010 makes the law FATCA to, to, um, to strike against uh, fiscal evasion. 
And in Europe, we, of course, public investment is the first answer to investment. I, we need a real budget, European budget, to help the people and the community. But also, with the FATCA climate law, we propose for that alliance to make, like Barack Obama made the FATCA law, and we propose the FATCA climate law, who said, in five years, no bank, no insurance company can work in Europe if it has not green its activity. To, first, to be totally transparent, all the bank, all the insurance must be totally transparent for all the activities in the world. Second, stop the fossil investment. And third, all the money who was of the fossil investment must go to the green activity. And we, if you have all, first so a, a bank of climate, a more important bank of climate, second time public investment with new fresh money, and third, the FATCA climate law, with this three solution, we can perhaps uh, win the battle. Thank All right, you. thank you, Fan. Thank you very much. So I, I understand this poses very massive questions and, and resistance to public expenditure in the U.S., which might have been broken by the COVID crisis. Who knows? We are now spending by the trillions. So maybe it is, after all, uh, a not so bad context for these kind of questions, which encountered a lot of resistance. So I want to say this is not obvious, and this certainly calls for a political debate, for political mobilization of each of us, because it, deep down, it's our rights to a healthy climate and to good jobs, which are at stake. So I would encourage each of you to continue uh, your efforts. I want to thank you so much, so very much. I'm sorry you could not address like uh, specifically each question, but I hope that you, you had glimpses of, of answers for each of your questions. We can stay in touch. We will forward the chat, we will forward things. Uh, one of our next sessions will certainly be about uh, a consensus in America between Republicans and Democrats on those issues, because if we want to build this, uh, these large political coalitions, we need to do it from within parties. And there are, you know, sensible people on, on, across the aisles. And this is uh, with those people that we want to talk, that we want to engage, and we want them to engage uh, the citizens. So thank you for contributing uh, to this uh, very important debate. Uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, thank you all. Uh, our panelists, which I uh, thank, and I ask you to thank them as well, uh, have to uh, go back to another uh, a kind of work. We can hang out if you will, and we can discuss some of your questions uh, if, if you want. Uh, I, I will be staying a bit more. Uh, again, thank you uh, very much, and uh, I'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, thank you, Muriel. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. A bientôt. Merci, a bientôt. Miguel, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, Alisa. Bye. Bye-bye.